the Ripper, a name that conjures fear, the most famous, the most iconic serial killer in history. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. The violent story of the Ripper is so shrouded in myth that outlandish theories still surface, making it hard to separate fact from fiction. We bring the streets of Whitechapel in 1888 back to life to see the Ripper's dark world. Taking the original police reports, witness statements, and research by the world's leading authorities, and using maps and photographs, even lighting the streets as the murderer would have seen them, we reconstruct Whitechapel as it was then. <laughs> revealing new clues about what really happened and who the Ripper really was. This is the definitive story of Jack the Ripper. In the early hours of the morning of the 4th of April, a 45-year-old prostitute named Emma Smith was walking through Whitechapel when she was savagely attacked. Her assault was the opening chapter of what is now known as the Autumn of Terror. A wave of extraordinary violence that horrified the East End and shocked the world. Though Emma Smith did manage to make it back to her lodgings, telling her friends she'd been attacked by three men, it was too late to help her. By the next day, she was dead. They robbed her and they subjected her to a savage assault. Uh, in fact, they thrust a blunt object into her and then they left her. The police began investigating her death, not realizing that it would become part of one of the biggest murder hunts in history. You had drunken brawls, you had domestic violence, you had street robberies. And so something like an attack on Emma Smith wouldn't have seemed that unusual at the time. Emma Smith certainly fits geographically with what one might think of Jack's kill zone. London, in 1888, was the largest and wealthiest city on Earth, the financial and commercial heart of the British Empire. Yet rubbing shoulders with the financial powerhouse of the city of London was an area of extreme deprivation, the East End. Yet for all the poverty, violence and hardship, murder itself was still uncommon in Victorian England. On average, the number of women murdered in London barely got into double figures. Martha Tabram was probably typical of thousands of women struggling to survive in the East End. After getting married to a warehouse foreman, she had been relatively well off, but following the birth of two children, she began drinking heavily. She ended up on the streets selling trinkets to survive. The one main thing that really seems to unite the victims is the fact they're all forced to leave or, or kicked out of their family homes. And the main common factor amongst all these women's stories is the fact they were all alcoholics, you know, forced to lead these very tragic lives and drank because of it. Monday, the 6th of August, was a bank holiday, and Martha had spent the evening drinking with her friend, Mary Ann Connolly, known by the nickname Pearly Pole. They'd ended up in one of the many local pubs. Tabram and Connolly met up with two soldiers, a private and a corporal, and spent until 11.45 drinking with them. Connolly said that Tabram took her soldier to a narrow street called George Yard, which was entered through a covered archway from Whitechapel High Street. That night, the residents of George Yard buildings heard noises of unruly behavior, but night noises of that kind were common, and they paid no attention. Mrs. Mahoney passed the murder spot at 1.50, seeing nothing unusual. 
PC Thomas Barrett saw a soldier loitering near the Wentworth Street entrance to George Yard. Evening, Corporal. Can I ask what you're doing here? Waiting for a chum. He, uh, he went with a girl. Of course you are. Move along. A gap of up to almost four hours separated Martha Tabram leaving the pub to her body being seen in a stairwell by a cab driver at 3.30 a.m. But he paid no attention. If Martha had not been killed by her soldier companion, then there was plenty of time for her to have met somebody else. Her body was found lying in a pool of blood and Dr. Timothy Colleen was sent for. She had been dead some three hours. Her age was about 36 and the body was very well nourished. The left lung was penetrated in five places and the right lung was penetrated in two places. The heart was penetrated in one place and that would be sufficient to cause death. My opinion was that one of the wounds was inflicted by some kind of dagger and that all of them were caused during life. 38 of the wounds on Tabram were inflicted with basically what they call a pen knife, and one was inflicted with a much longer bladed knife, which penetrated right the way to her breast base. Martha Tabram had been the victim of a frenzied attack, stabbed nearly 40 times, all the wounds whilst she was alive. The police became convinced that Martha had been murdered by a soldier. PC Barrett, who'd seen a soldier loitering near the entrance to George Yard, was certain that he would be able to recognise the man again. So he was taken to an identification parade at the Tower of London, and he did identify two uh, soldiers who he said he, he, he could have been the man, but both soldiers had cast-iron alibis. Police attention moved to Pearly Pole, but she failed to identify anyone at an identification parade at the Tower of London. But then Connolly said that the soldiers' caps had white bands. This meant that they had to be Coldstream Guardsmen stationed at Wellington Barracks near Buckingham Palace. It's him. Are you positive? Sir. Connolly picked out two soldiers, but both men were able to prove that they had returned to the barracks shortly before 11 that night and could have had nothing to do with the murder. The realisation that Pearlie Pole was not going to lead them to the killer was a huge embarrassment for the police. The murder of Martha Tabram received a fair amount of press coverage and comparisons were made with the brutality of the assault on Emma Smith, the similarity of their professions and the geographical proximity. Martha Tabram's inquest ended with a verdict of willful murder against person or persons unknown, a phrase that would reoccur with frustrating regularity as 1888 progressed. In their brutality and the targeting of prostitutes, the murder shared similarities with the Ripper's later killings. But were they the Ripper's work? Some are convinced that they were. Emma Smith and Martha Tabram represent early exploratory uh, questions, shall we say, being put forth to the world. When Jack next struck, he had a new formed image of what he wanted to do and what he was about. And strike he would, just a few weeks later. Visit Whitechapel today and you'd have no inkling of how the East End of London looked in 1888 when Jack the Ripper walked these streets. It was then a slum landscape full of decaying buildings with a population of largely poor and destitute people whose only home was a bed in a common lodging house or, if they were lucky, in a room in which the whole family had to live. Using computer-generated imagery and drawing on contemporary maps, plans and other documents, we can see this cramped area as it was then, a dense, confined warren of narrow streets where two unsolved murders had already been committed. Jack the Ripper was about to strike. But reconstructing the street as it looked then 
Bucks Row is revealed as a short, narrow road, occupied on one side by a row of workmen's cottages and on the other by large warehouses. Yet seeing this simple layout as it was then is vital to understanding how the Ripper committed his crimes. At 20 to 4 in the morning, Charles Cross was walking to work along Bucks Row. He saw something on the ground against the gates and he went yeah, to investigate mate. with another passerby, Robert there. Paul. I think she's dead. Look, let's move her. No, I'm not touching her. Besides, I'm going to be late for work. Come on, let's at least sort our clothing out. She looks a right mess. Cross and Paul headed off, hoping to report their find to a policeman. Soon after, PC John Neal entered Buck's Row on his beat. He saw the body on the ground. The woman who gazed back with sightless eyes had had her throat cut twice. One of the cuts went down to the spine. But what Neil didn't realize was that the woman had been hideously mutilated. The police summoned Dr. Reese Ralph Llewellyn, whose surgery in residence was nearby. He was not required to do more than decide whether the person was dead or alive, and the police hurried to have the body removed to the mortuary. Nowadays, if a similar murder had occurred, then the police would have cordoned the entire area off, uh, forensics would come in, all the uh, CSI would be done, and yet, in those days, they believed that the longer the body remained at the scene, then it became a place for sightseers to come. You could have public disorder from that. So the important thing was to get the body away from the scene of the crime as quickly as possible. But within an hour of the body being discovered, has been loaded onto the police ambulance and her body taken round to the mortuary. And then the scene is washed down. So the body's discovered 3.40 a.m. in the morning, and by 6 a.m. in the morning, blood stains have been washed away and the body's gone. In the mortuary, the body was stripped by two attendants and it was discovered that the woman had been disemboweled. Dr. Llewellyn was immediately summoned and this time he made a thorough examination, later describing the woman's injuries in his testimony at the inquest. Two or three inches in on the left side, there was a wound running in a ragged manner. This wound was very deep. <coughs> There were three or four similar cuts running downwards along the right side. All of these wounds had been inflicted by a knife, used violently and downwards. He's not just stabbing, he's actually mutilating by opening up the, the genital area and then um, mutilating inside the, uh, the rip that he's made. I mean, he, he does actually stab uh, at her liver. Dr. Llewellyn was of the opinion that the woman had been murdered where she lay, but that most of her blood had soaked into her clothes. The newspaper's interest in what had previously been seen as a local story now climbed to new levels, and Scotland Yard took charge of the investigation, sending in one of their top officers, Inspector Frederick Aberline. Aberline was a hugely respected and popular inspector. He was returned from Scotland Yard because of his vast and intimate knowledge of the area. Basically, people knew him and he knew the people and how the, the area operated. The victim was eventually identified as Mary Ann Nichols, known to everyone as Polly. She had started life as a servant before marrying William Nichols and having children. William Nichols claimed in 1888 that the breakup of the marriage was due to Mary's drinking and alcoholism. Her father, Edward Walker, claimed differently that William was having an affair with Rosetta Wolves, who had a child by him in 1883. It is easy to blame these women for ending their lives as drunks, but in 1888, life offered a woman few choices if the marriage went wrong. For Polly Nichols, that meant she had no alternative after leaving the marital home, but to spend the next seven years drifting from workhouse to workhouse. According to the newspapers, things got so bad that she ended up sleeping rough in Trafalgar Square over the winter of 1887, joining hundreds of other homeless people who dossed there every night. 
That same winter, Trafalgar Square would become the focus of the notorious Bloody Sunday riots, when the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, Sir Charles Warren, deployed armed troops to violently suppress the demonstrators. Unscathed, Polly managed to find work as a domestic servant in Wandsworth, and in April 1888, she wrote a letter to her father. I just write to say you'll be glad to know that I'm settled in my new place and going all right up to now. My people went out yesterday and have not returned, so I am left in charge. It's a grand place inside. They're teetotalers and religious, so I ought to get on. I hope you all right, and the boy has work. From yours truly, Polly. Answer soon, please, and let me know how you are. He wrote back, but never received a reply. That was perhaps because Polly had been caught stealing from her employers and had absconded to the East End. Polly took lodgings in Thrall Street, the heart of a district known for its common lodging or DOS houses, where thousands of poor and homeless people could have a bed for just fourpence a night. But they had a fearful reputation as hotbeds of crime and immorality. Despite her troubles, Polly had somehow managed to preserve her looks. She was 43 years old and had some teeth missing, but the press reported that she appeared to be 10 years younger. In the final hours of the 30th of August, she was found in the kitchen of her Thrall Street lodging house. Where's your money, Polly? Sorry, I ain't got none. Sorry, Polly. Rules is rules. <laughs> Never mind. I'll soon have my DOS money. See what a jolly new bonnet I have. <laughs> An hour later, one of Polly's friends, Emily Holland, bumped into her in Osborne Street. Polly, you all right, love? Oh, no. I've had me dust money three times today. I've gone and spent it. Why don't you come back to the lodging house? No. I've got to get me dust money somehow. Ta-ta. ta dearie. Polly walked eastwards towards the main road. It was the last time she was seen alive. She was out looking for a customer. They all unwittingly contribute to their own deaths because they know they've got to go with a client uh, to a dark place. She'd had three customers that day, but she was confident of getting a fourth customer because she'd got the bonnet. See what a jolly new bonnet I have. I'll soon get my fourth customer. That bonnet is, is going to attract somebody, and it does. In my opinion, the prostitute would have approached the customer, hand on the chest, Hand up, what the phrase is now, and I shouldn't think it's changed much over the years. Want the business. Want the business. Polly Nichols took her customer round to Bucks Road by the old schoolhouse. I think she would have come through from uh, Whitechapel Road through Woods's building, generally known to everyone as Piss Alley. Seeing the streets as they would have looked then, it becomes clear that the murderer must have taken a considerable risk. Although the street was dark, there were street lights near where the body was found, and people lived in the neighboring cottages and in the adjacent Essex Wharf. Assault takes place in a gateway, and it's adjacent to two rounds of houses, and any cries or screams would almost certainly have been heard by someone. Harriet Lilly, who lived at number seven Bucks Row, was awakened by a noisy goods train passing on the nearby railway line. And as the noise quietened, she heard some moans or gasps in the street, followed by whispering. But no other nearby residents heard anything. Mrs. Emma Green, who lived near the murder site, was typical. Me and my daughter went to bed at 11 o'clock. We didn't see nothing after that. We slept right through. We were out like a light. The authorities had managed to identify the victim, but they'd achieved little else. In the face of a growing general opinion that the Whitechapel killings had to be connected, the police had been utterly unable to suggest a motive and were still clinging to the idea that they were gang-related. Opinion is gaining ground that the murderers are the same who committed the two previous murders near the same spot. It is believed that these gangs who make their appearance during the early hours of the morning are in the habit of blackmailing these poor unfortunate creatures and when their demands are refused, violence follows. Not so long after the murder of Polly Nichols, 
a journalist did go back to the site of the Bucks Row murder and found that crowds were gathering there to discuss the murder, the murderer's motive, and who the murderer might have been. The consensus among the women was that the crimes were gang-related. But the reporter also spoke to an old man who actually told him that that's a got-up yarn. He said, if it was a gang responsible for it, you can bet that one or t'other of them would have split on the others and it'd all come out. Bet you it's not been done like that. The Ripper murders, as they would be known by the world for the next 120 years, had begun. With the murder of Polly Nichols, it was realized that there was a very unusual murderer at large. As our reconstruction shows, Jack the Ripper was acting spontaneously and very quickly, perhaps drawing on local knowledge. Jack strangled his victims from the front, causing blood pressure to fall and ensuring that there were limited blood spurts when, having lowered them to the ground, he quickly cut their throats twice to ensure their silence. The mutilation of the victims was performed post-mortem. That combination of extreme violence and opportunism would almost certainly mean that today the killer known as Jack the Ripper would be labelled a psychotic serial killer. He strikes on the spur of the moment. There are some elements which um, involve planning, like uh, avoiding the blood uh, spatter, um, but basically brings his victims under control through blitz attacks. That is classic disorganized serial killer. Mary Ann Nichols was buried on the 6th of September in a polished elm coffin supplied by a Hanbury Street undertaker. Ironically, in a little over one week, it would be the residents of Hanbury Street who would wake up to an even worse outrage, literally on their very doorstep. Three violent and exceptionally brutal murders had been committed in Whitechapel. The victims all prostitutes, all living locally. But while the police had no leads, the killer was about to strike again. Today, 29 Hanbury Street no longer exists. But carefully reconstructing the street as it was then reveals number 29 as a three-story building with a garret for a fourth floor. In 1888, the eight rooms in this one-time family home were occupied by 17 people. The front door opened into a hallway leading the length of the house to a rear door, and beyond that, a yard. There's been another murder. It's awful. Annie Chapman was probably born in Paddington in 1840 and was married in 1869. And a photograph that has been passed down to a descendant shows what looks like a marriage photograph with her and her husband, John. This is the only remaining photograph of any of the victims while they were alive. It suggests that a respectable and happy future was assured for the young couple, but that was not to be. Annie and her husband and the children were based in a place called Clua in Windsor, and for many months, John was working as a coachman and domestic servant for this rich baronet. But Annie was an alcoholic, and would be seen wandering through the countryside drunk. She was an embarrassment to her employer. The baronet didn't want her on the estate anymore, so John was forced to separate from Annie. Whether he did that gratefully or reluctantly, I guess we'll never know. Annie Chapman ended up in the East End, in 1888 living at Crossingham's lodging house in Dorset Street. Dorset Street was lined with decaying buildings, most converted into common lodging or DOS houses, some catering for as many as 400 people every night. A notorious thoroughfare, known for its disreputable characters and lawlessness, Annie remained here until her death, taking up hawking and prostitution. According to the subsequent investigation, on the late afternoon of September the 7th, Annie was seen by a friend in Dorset Annie, Street. I thought you was going to Stratford this morning. I was, but I feel too ill. Oh, anyway, I must pull myself together and go and get some money. Or I shall have no lodging. In the early hours of the next morning, she was found eating a baked potato in the Doss House kitchen by the night watchman, John Evans, who'd been sent to collect hey, her Doss money. you got your Doss money? 
she didn't have it. No, well then you know the rules. Come on, off you go, we've got. Come on. He watched her leave and make her way down Little Paternoster Road towards Spitalfields. By carefully piecing together the testimony of people in Hanbury Street in the early hours of that morning, it is possible to come to a likely scenario of what must have happened. At 5.30, Elizabeth Long was walking past number 29 Hanbury Street on her way to Spitalfields Market when she saw a woman who she believed was Annie Chapman standing with a man hard by the shutters of the house. Will you? Yes. She was certain of the time as she had just heard the brewery clock strike the half hour. I did not see the man's face, but I noticed that he was dark. He was wearing a brown, low-crowned felt hat. By the look of him, he seemed to me a man over 40 years of age. He appeared to me to be a little taller than the deceased. I should say he looked like uh, what I should call shabby genteel. I left him standing there, uh, and I did not look back. At about the same time, Albert Kadosh, who was suffering a urinary infection, made one of several visits into next door's backyard to visit the outside toilet. Kadosh heard what he thought was something fall against the fence in the yard next door, but thought nothing of it. He left for work, but did not see Mrs. Long or anyone standing outside number 29. It was in the yard of number 29, less than 30 minutes later, that Annie Chapman's mutilated body was found by resident John Davis. Here, there's a woman in the yard there. There's been another murder. It's awful. It was immediately clear that Annie Chapman had been the subject of an attack of unprecedented ferocity. Dr. Baxter Phillips conducted the post-mortem. There were two distinct clean cuts on the left side of the spine. They were parallel with each other and separated by about half an inch. The muscular structures appeared as though an attempt had been made to separate the bones of the neck. The abdomen had been entirely laid open the intestines, severed from their mesenteric attachments, had been lifted out of the body and placed on the shoulder of the corpse. Whilst from the pelvis, the uterus and its appendages with the upper portion of the vagina and the posterior two-thirds of the bladder had been entirely removed. The killer, as we, we see, his, his fury keeps increasing. This is part of his progression. Dr. Phillips' cataloguing of the injuries suggested to him that the killer had to be a medical man, or at the very least, someone who had a working knowledge of anatomy. And his conclusions about the time of death and how much time was needed to perform the mutilations would help build the myth that Jack the Ripper was a doctor. Obviously, the work was that of an expert, of one, at least, who had such a knowledge of anatomical or pathological examinations as to be enabled to secure the pelvic organs with one sweep of the knife. Dr. Baxter Phillips' conclusion that the murderer possessed anatomical or pathological knowledge and had sufficient skill to quickly cut out the organs encouraged the police to begin investigating doctors and medical students. But our reconstruction shows that some of Dr. Phillips' conclusions may have misdirected the police investigation. From his examination of the corpse, Dr. Phillips put the time of death at 4.30 or possibly earlier, but John Richardson had been sitting on the top step at 4.45, 15 minutes after the time of death estimated by the doctor, but did not see a body, nor did he smell a disemboweled corpse. Then there was the evidence of Albert Kadosh, who left his home at 5.30. The same time Annie Chapman had been seen in the street by Elizabeth Long, but he saw nobody. Long had been certain of the time, thanks to the brewery clock. But if she'd heard it strike the quarter past instead of the half past, her version would tie in with Albert Kadosh. If they were right, then Baxter Phillips had to be wrong about the timing of the murder. 
and Annie Chapman was coldly murdered in broad daylight. The science of determining time of death by body temperature is rather arcane, and certainly uh, the accepted practice today of taking rectal temperature uh, was not part of Dr. Baxter Phillips's assessment at the time. It was a relatively cold morning. Uh, her body had been majorly eviscerated, and she'd lost a lot of blood. As the morning wore on and news of the murder spread, public anxiety turned into panic. Residents of the neighboring houses did brisk business renting out rooms that overlooked the yard to curious onlookers. During the whole of Saturday and yesterday, a large crowd congregated in front of the house in Hambury Street. Great complaints are made concerning the inadequate police protection in the East End, and this want is even admitted by the local police authorities themselves. So you had sort of the, the radical newspapers who used the murders really to have a go basically at the police. You also had uh, elements of the press that were looking into the philanthropy of it all. For example, with Mary Nichols and Annie Chapman, these two ladies were sent to their deaths simply because they didn't have fourpence. Had they had the fourpence to pay for their beds in their common lodging houses, then they wouldn't have been out on the streets. And of course, then you had the sensational newspapers. These horrors in the East End of London are happening, and there's a bogeyman out there. I think every newspaper had an agenda that they used the murders for. It was newspaper pressure that also led to the first significant arrest in the case, as the Star newspaper pushed its pet theory that a mystery Jewish man known as Leather Apron was behind the deaths. In one particularly lurid account, the Star described him as a noiseless midnight terror who preyed on the local prostitutes. When the body was found in the yard, close to the body was a freshly washed leather apron. Now, as it transpired, this belonged to a resident of number 29 Hambury Street. His mother had found it in a cupboard, washed it, and put it out to dry. However, certain elements of the press latched onto this because it fed nicely into the leather apron scare. Suspicion quickly fell on a man named John Pizer, a Jewish slipper maker who went by the same nickname of Leather Apron. On 10th of September, Sergeant Thick went to Pizer's home in Whitechapel. Ah, you are the man I want. I'm arresting you on suspicion of the murder of Annie Chapman. Various newspapers heaped abuse on Pizer, but unfortunately for the police, he was able to prove that he was nowhere near Whitechapel on the night of the murders. But the leather apron scare did much to fuel anti-Semitism in Whitechapel. East London had become a home to Russian Jewish refugees following the anti-Jewish pogroms that had come in the wake of Tsar Alexander II's assassination in 1881. Many had undergone extreme hardship in their desperate efforts to find safety in the East End. The change in the area's fragile ethnic balance had resulted in a rise of violent anti-Semitism. So you now get a great deal of policing in the area, and this certainly does bring the anti-Semitism under control, and made it almost impossible, if you like, for the killer to strike again. So for a brief period of time, the people of the East End got a respite from their autumn of terror. That did not stop the radical press continuing to use the murders to fuel their attacks on the police and the Home Office. And when public opinion is at last aroused and the whole East End is under a red terror, if a mad panic sweeps through the quarters, desolated by a maniac's knife, the Home Office and Scotland Yard will be alone to blame. Annie Chapman was buried in an unmarked grave on the 14th of September, 1888. The inquest jury returned yet another verdict of willful murder against person or persons unknown. Dark Annie's spirit still walks Whitechapel, unavenged by justice. Her dreadful end has compelled Londoners to reflect what it must be like to have no home except the kitchen of a low lodging house. To sit there, sick and weak, bruised and wretched, to be turned out after midnight, to come across your murderer and caress your assassin. Four unsolved murders, an angry press, and a complete lack of firm clues, the police were still no closer to any kind of arrest. Then the Central News Agency received a letter which would give the murderer a special place in the history of crime. It was addressed to the boss and written in red ink. Though it claimed to be from the killer himself, 
At first, they treated it as a joke. But realizing its potential significance, the agency sent it on to Chief Inspector Donald Swanson, the head of the investigation at Scotland Yard. Dear boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talk about being on the right track. That joke about leather apron gave me real fits. There really is nothing to prove that this letter was written by the murderer himself, and senior police officials of the time and modern commentators have suggested it came from the pen of a journalist. But what makes this letter significant and important is it's the one that gave us that name. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. The name was a work of genius, and when the murderer struck again, the press would be proclaiming the most famous name in criminal history. Jack would soon return to the streets, and in a more shocking way than anything seen before, he would commit two murders on the same night. With four unsolved murders, Jack the Ripper would soon strike again, with a murder on the 20th of September of a 43-year-old woman. She would be the first of two victims that night in what later became known as the double event. Burner Street, off Commercial Road, was some distance from the other murder sites. This is what it would have looked like that autumn evening. The east side of the street was a row of houses. One of these was used as a fruit and vegetable shop. On the corner, there was a pub. Number 40 was an old three-storey building that had been turned into a socialist club. Along the side was a passage leading into Dutfield's yard. It was here, in the early hours of the 30th of September, that the body of a woman would be found. Her name was Elizabeth Stride. Elizabeth Stride was actually born in Sweden, in a little town called Torslander. Uh, she grew up in a family of four. When she was older, she went to live in Gothenburg. After working in domestic service, she fell foul of the law as she was recorded as a prostitute. Elizabeth had a stillborn child in about 1865. It was considered that it probably died because she was suffering from a sexually transmitted disease. In 1869, she marries a man named John Thomas Stride. He's a carpenter. They have their own coffee house at Poplar for a, a short number of years. Elizabeth was reasonably well-educated, bright and intelligent, a linguist, and able to run a business. But things would go wrong. Elizabeth's relationship with John Stride broke up and she ended up living in a Whitechapel Doss house. On 29th of September, Elizabeth was seen drinking in a pub called the Queen's Head. She then returned to her lodging house to smarten herself up to go out. Charlie! Yeah? Can I borrow your brush, Charlie? You could if I could find the bloody thing. Charlie. At 11 p.m., two labourers were entering the Bricklayer's Arms on Settle Street. As they went in, they saw Elizabeth leaving with a man. Yeah, that's Lev Rayburn getting around you, that is. Bugger off. He was described as short, with a dark moustache and sandy eyelashes. He was wearing a Billy Cock hat and a morning suit and coat. Elizabeth and the man walked quickly away toward Commercial Road. About this time, Matthew Packer claimed to have sold grapes to a couple who came to his shop next to Dutfield's yard. His story received widespread publicity and passed into folklore. However, no remains of grapes were found in Stride's stomach. 45 minutes later, William Marshall saw Elizabeth with a man on Burner Street. As the meeting in the club finished, many people left for home, and for a while the street was busy. Inside the club, some members stayed on to join in some singing. The earlier rain had stopped, and the air was fresh. Around 12.35, PC William Smith saw Elizabeth with a young man opposite the club. He was described as five foot seven inches in height, wearing a dark overcoat and a felt deerstalker hat, and was carrying a newspaper parcel. Five minutes later, Morris Eagle came through the gates of Duckfield's yard. He saw nothing unusual. At 12.45, James Brown left a chandler's shop at the junction of Burner Street and Fairclough Street. 
he passed a woman and a man standing by the board school. Brown did not recall the woman wearing a flower and remembered the man as being dressed in a long coat, so it's possible he saw an entirely different couple. Not tonight. Some other night. At the same time as Brown's sighting, perhaps the most important incident of the entire investigation was witnessed by Israel Schwartz, a 22-year-old man described as being of Jewish appearance who spoke no English. The head of the police investigation, Chief Inspector Donald Swanson, was later to give to the Home Office a comprehensive account of what Schwartz saw. The man tried to pull the woman into the street, but he turned her around and threw her down on the footway. And then she screamed three times. Now, Israel Schwartz thought it was a domestic argument, and he didn't want to get involved, so he crossed over the road to avoid doing so. On crossing to the opposite side of the street, he saw a second man standing lighting his pipe. The man who threw the woman down called out to the man apparently on the other side of the road. Schwartz walked away, but finding that he was followed by the second man, he ran as far as the railway arch, but the man didn't follow so far. Schwartz can't say whether the two men were together or known to each other. Upon being taken to the mortuary, Schwartz identified the body as that of the woman he had seen. The first man, the man who was carrying out the attack, he described it as being about five foot five. Uh, he said he had a fair complexion, he had dark hair, he had a, a, a small brown moustache, thick set built, and he wore a peak cap. Now, the other man, he said that he was about five foot eleven, he was about thirty five, uh, had a fair complexion, he wore an old dark felt hat, and he held a clay pipe in his hand. The Home Office asked for an explanation of the word Lipsky. Lipsky! and was told that since the previous year when a Jew named Lipsky was hanged for murder, the name had been used to insult Jews. Another crucial witness was Fanny Mortimer, who lived just 25 feet from the murder spot. I was stood in my doorway sometime between 12.30 and 1 o'clock. Well, I went outside shortly after I heard the measured stamp of a policeman on his beat. Well, I was in my door no more in 10 minutes. The only person on the street was a young man carrying a black shiny bag. This man, who may have inadvertently contributed to the iconic image of Jack the Ripper as a man carrying a Gladstone bag, was Leon Goldstein, who was passing through Burner Street at 12.55, placing Mrs. Mortimer at her door between 12.50 and 1 a.m., a matter of minutes after Schwartz had witnessed the attack outside Dutfield's yard. This means that the footsteps she heard and believed belonged to a policeman might well have been those of the murderer leaving the murder scene. Looking at Burner Street, as it would have appeared on that fateful night, it can be seen that Elizabeth Stride's body, just inside the passage to Dutfield's yard, would not have been visible to Mrs. Mortimer, even though she was only a matter of yards away. Mrs. Mortimer went back inside, and a few minutes later she heard a pony and a cart pass by. It was a jewellery salesman named Louis Deemschutz. But on turning into Dutfield's yard, Deemschutz's pony shied to the left and refused to go further. The reason soon became apparent. There, at the corner, lay the body of Elizabeth Stride. Her throat had been cut. With four women murdered, the police no nearer an arrest, and the public's mounting panic fueled by press speculation, the discovery of a fifth murdered woman in Burner Street was met with disbelief. But the Ripper had not finished his work for the night. Before morning, there would be a sixth body, that of Catherine Eddowes. The definitive story of Jack the Ripper continues. His increasing savagery as he claimed more victims. I never saw such a sight. We see the streets as the Ripper would have done, following the trail of clues, and we meet the key suspects the police believed answered the question, who was Jack the Ripper? And you can catch the concluding part of our investigation into London's most notorious serial killer tomorrow. Jack the Ripper, the definitive story, is brand new at nine.